So hi everyone. So welcome back to the podcast. So today we're joined by Leron Shapira. So hi Leron, would you be able to share a bit about uh how you raised one hundred and thirty million dollars for your first venture, and any advice you can share for upcoming founders and how they can make themselves venture ready? Okay, Gruhi, great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Um, so how did I raise 130 million? So it happened over multiple rounds, and this was back in 2009 to 2016, that time period. Um, so basically, we had a startup. We were making it was called Quixie. We were making search technology for app stores, and we had a lot of investors at various stages who thought it was promising. Um, at one time, we had a partnership with Ask.com where they were doing app search and they were sending the queries over to our engine, um, and that helped us raise a round of 20 million dollars. Um, and from there, we, you know, we, we kind of stumbled a bit. We didn't really know where we were going to go from there after we got to that point. Um, and we got on this different trajectory when we raised money from Alibaba. So, you know, Alibaba out of China, uh, one of the biggest companies there, they were a strategic investor who came in and led our series C round. That was a $50 million round. So it was very interesting, you know, company trajectories, they can go a lot of different ways. In our case, we were kind of plateauing in the U S strategically, we could go a number of directions and we were kind of struggling, but we went the strategic direction with Alibaba. We got $50 million. Uh, we started building technology specifically for their app store in China for their own operating system that they were launching for mobile. We raised more money from them. So I think Alibaba in total put in almost $100 million, closer to $100 million than $50 million. Um, and that it kind of took over the company that we were doing all this work for Alibaba. So it's, you know, it's kind of a random story looking in retrospect because that didn't work out for us either. So the whole company was actually just a giant failure. So I feel sorry for Alibaba because they really, they didn't quite get their money's worth. I mean, they they got a nice app store search for a couple of years, but it wasn't worth the money they put in and our U.S. investors didn't get their money it was worth. So I don't think that I'm a good role model for for raising money because you should try to do something with the money that actually pays off, right? And I failed to do that. Um, but to your question of, um, you know, how do you raise money successfully, right? Uh, how do you navigate the venture world? Um, I think the single hardest thing is just having a good idea and executing well, right? I do think that there are a lot of VCs, especially today, there is a lot of capital chasing good companies and you don't have to be great at pitching. Um, you do have to just do a minimum level of having a good business and communicating that your business is good. And all the tips that people give you for pitching, the reason you need those tips is because maybe it's questionable how good your idea really is. And your runway is probably uh, weighing on you like, oh, uh -oh we got to raise because we have six months. We better pull out all the VC tricks. But if you're kind of smart in the first place where you know your business makes a lot of sense, you know it's kind of a slam dunk. It, it's, it's, it's a lifelong project that you're going to do no matter what. Then when you talk to a VC, I think that's going to show through. And also the metrics are going to show through. And hopefully you don't have too much stress about your runway. And you just don't need to break out a book of VC tips when you just have all that you know foundation in place. That's amazing. So you talked a bit about uh, your company being a giant, giant failure. So could you just dive a bit deeper into that? Like what have, have been some lessons and mistakes you've learned from building a failing company per se? Like what, what could the audience take away from all this? Yeah, lessons from building a failing company. It's kind of interesting because um, when you have a company that is on the brink of success, uh, I think this is a, a pretty insightful quote from Peter Thiel. You know, sometimes you learn the most lessons when you're uh, succeeding, but you're struggling really hard to have that success. But if you're just like failing too hard, then you don't learn that many lessons because you're like too far away from success. And to be honest, I was failing pretty hard. I wasn't that close to success, but I managed to take away some lessons anyway. Um, and one of the lessons is just that you can be in something that's failing bad and the knowledge of the failure and the scope of the failure won't even be evenly distributed. So there were a lot of departments in the company, a, a lot of VP level employees who were like, yeah, this is good. I'm excited about what we're doing. And at one point it finally dawned on me, which is something I, I should have dawned on me earlier, but it did dawn on me like, oh, I'm seeing a lot of problems with this company. I think the, the plane is heading down, right? Like we're not in a good place. And even me just communicating why we're not in a good place uh, to, to the relevant leaders was surprisingly difficult. Um, there was a, you know, it's 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 easy. I make the analogy to like chickens running with their head cut off, but like they don't know it. It's like you see a chicken running a head cut off, and the chicken is like, everything is fine. <laughs> like I know what I'm doing. 
And I'm like, I don't think that you do. And this was like a, a common phenomenon in, in a lot of these departments. And then I, I would even talk to some of our investors and the investors are like, I'm so excited. This has so much potential. You know, what we need to do is repurpose the technology. And I'm like, well, the technology is actually not in good shape right now. Like there were a lot of issues and I was almost being like gaslighted uh, by, by people that, you know, I felt like I knew the reality better than them. And they were like somehow confident and sure enough, like they were wrong and, um, you know, and, and we did in fact fail, right. I just realized it a little earlier than most. Um, and that experience, you know, I took that away and it served me well in my, uh, crypto skeptic days, right. Because if you've been following my Twitter, I've been posting a lot, especially in 2021, 2022 at the height of the crypto bubble. I'm like, I know it seems like all these smart people are telling you that this makes sense, but it does not make sense. This is an emperor has no clothes situation. And I've been there before. I've been there when I was the guy who started the company. I was kind of like the Vitalik of Quixie, right? Like he founded Ethereum. So like Vitalik, I would think is getting to the point where like he should know better. He should look at the ecosystem and be like, look, I founded this, but I know that it doesn't really make sense anymore. Like the vision didn't really play out. Vitalik himself is not really admitting that. Okay. He's off doing his own thing. And, and, and some, some of the stuff he says makes sense. Some of it doesn't, but I was in the position of founding something that I thought made sense. Um, time passed and I saw that it didn't make sense and it was largely my fault and I admitted it and I tried to fix it. And I got into a situation where other people around me were drinking the Kool-Aid that I wasn't serving anymore. Like they were just drinking like leftover Kool-Aid. Um, and, and like I said, that served me well, when I looked at crypto, I'm like, wow, all these people are drinking this like stale Kool-Aid that like, they should not be drinking this. Uh, so that idea that you can be pointing out to smart people that the emperor has no clothes and they're not responding is now like, uh, you know, is, is happened to me at least twice now in my life. So you had mentioned a bit about investors. So one of the audience members called student of venture capital would like to know, how did you connect with impressive investors like Zain, Jafar, and like, what does it take to actually connect with such people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, if you're asking about Zain in particular, I met him, we had, we actually had a mutual investor. So um, uh, Maynard Webb's fund uh, invested in my first company, and they invested in Zane's company too. Um, and yeah, I mean, Zane is an awesome investor who, who invested in my current company. And um, he, w the company that he was running at the time was incredibly successful. They sold for almost a billion dollars, whereas my company sold for like zero. So <laughs> definitely a different outcome there. Um, and how did I meet him? So we, you know, it, it's a nice way to meet people when you go to these uh, retreats, which are essentially networking events, right? So it's, it's a nice way to network. So if you like to go to networking events, by all means do so, right? Especially if, if you can get into one where you kind of know there's going to be a, a good set of people. Um, it's not that hard to find a networking event with a good set of people, like anything put on by Y Combinator that's open to the public. You're going to have a, a pretty good set of people who are at least hustling and motivated, uh, right? Even if they're not already billionaires, at least they're, they probably have the right, uh, you know, grind set to succeed. Um, but I will say this, look, if you want to talk to an impressive investor, like the, the thing that opens the conversation is more like just showing some evidence that, um, you know, that you're on a good trajectory and it doesn't take much, like even just having like a targeted message where it's like, Hey, I looked you up. I saw that. I like this thing that you're doing. I thought I'd send you a message, uh, because you might be interested in this. And then here's like a piece of work, um, that I did that I want you to take a quick look at. And the hardest part of a, a cold email like that or a cold Twitter DM or whatever it is, the hardest part is just like having a nugget that actually catches their attention. So it's not about the connection to them. It's not about the warm intro. It's just about like, why do you think that you're doing something of interest? And if your idea is actually good in the first place, then like it shouldn't be that hard to make them see that there's something to your idea, right? I think like actually spending your time in the first place working on something that's good and that's interesting that's probably the hardest part here. Okay, sure. So I think my biggest takeaway from all that was to be clear on your value add. Like, what are you exactly bringing value to the investor and why should they be the ones looking at your message? So my next question is, so when you were founding Relationship Hero, what was the scrappiest thing that you did to build it out? Hmm, the scrappiest thing for relationship. I think we, we've always done the lean startup methodology. So we always just say, you know, how do we just do a little bit of work to validate if we're on the right track and if this is what customers need? So one thing we did is we started a Facebook group before we even had a website or anything. And we just invited our friends. And the key metric that we were looking at is just like, do our friends keep coming back to this group? And they would, they would, they would post screenshots of like, Hey, I just went on a dating app and I had this exchange and this is what happened. And I'm talking to this girl and now I don't know what to tell her. Like she's saying this, I don't know what she means. Or she's like flaking on me. And then like people would comment like, Oh, have you considered this? Or maybe she's thinking this. 
and we'd be like psychoanalyzing our friend's dating life. And this was before anybody was paying any money, before we had a website, before we had any investors. But this was really the, the kernel of relationship here is this idea of like, you know, our friends, people need other people to help them out, right, with with some of their dating and relationship issues. Like, the right, this is a behavior, a human behavior. This this has value. So the next step is just how do we scale up uh, the way that we help that value and also how do we monetize it, right? So how do we get adequately uh, paid for it in a way that has a profitable business? So those are kind of the next steps. Those are some great points. And I absolutely loved your point on starting a Facebook group and just inviting your friends in and just having a solid way to connect with the audience even before you launch a product. So how important is that to have an audience before you launch a product? So in our case, I wouldn't say that we had an audience, right? Because normally when people say you have an audience, it's like, oh, yeah, here I have uh, 20,000 followers. Um, and I guess now by this point today, I guess I've got an audience on Twitter, right? Because I've got like 30,000 followers. So um, so I could be like, wow, because I have this audience, if I start something that's in the space of like, I don't even know, like technology for entrepreneurs, right? Because a lot of entrepreneurs follow me. Um, then like I would have an advantage because maybe I could get like a hundred likes on my tweet. Right. And I'd get like thousands of people to see my tweet and that could give me like a publicity boost. And then I wouldn't have to even like go to a reporter. Like I wouldn't need to be in tech crunch cause I would already be on this tweet. Um, so there's this idea that you get a leg up if you have an audience. Um, and I just, I, I think that in some cases it can be a big leg up for like, especially if your audience is big, right. If you have a million people in your audience, right. If you're like a celebrity, um, there are some doors that can open pretty quick, right? Because you can you can get a sponsorship to any brand that makes sense, right? So if people follow you, if if you're a, a surfing celebrity, right, and then you and somebody has like a surfboard that you like and you tweet about it, it is possible you might drive. I don't even know uh, hundreds of purchases, right? And if you get a commission of fifty dollars, that could be like I don't know what's fifty times hundred. Okay, five thousand, right? So I mean, you could milk it for a little bit. Um, I think it's rare to find somebody who has an audience that's not huge, that's only like kind of small, like my audience, and successfully monetizes just their audience. And like that audience is such a huge percentage of why they're winning compared to just like the idea itself and the execution that they're doing is good. Like I feel like it's mostly idea and execution and audience is just like a small boost, which is nice, but it's, it's like you don't need it. Yeah, that's great that you shared about how audience is not something that you really need. But if you have a focused and engaged audience, that could really work out to your benefit. Kind of. Is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah, I mean, I, so I do think like there are absolutely stories of people who have the right audience that's either focused and or large, right? The best is focused and large. Right. And they take that audience and you do have a shortcut. Right. So if you want to build like a community, right. Like, oh, wow, this person is starting a community. OK, I'll join their community. Um, or you could in some cases in the startup community, anybody who is sufficiently famous in the startup community can be like, you know what? I have a fund. Send money to my fund. And, and before you know it, you've got millions of dollars in your fund that you can invest. And that's that's pretty lucrative. So there is a conversion between uh, fame and having a fund that that could work out pretty well uh, if you're if you're like an influencer in the startup community. Um, in some cases, there's a conversion to paid content. So you could be like, hey, sign up for my course, right? This course costs a thousand dollars over like six months. Pay me a thousand dollars, and it's I don't have to work too hard because I've already like written up the content. And so if I have like a hundred thousand followers, right, I don't even, if I get a few hundred to sign up, okay, I can make a few hundred thousand dollars. So there, there is definitely a conversion, but if you don't have the audience already, the path where you first build an audience and then do something with that audience, I feel like that order of events is not strategic. I think if you're going to build an audience, you should do it as a side effect of like your first effort, but have your first effort make you money more directly. And then for your second effort, you can use the audience as a boost. Yeah, that's a great framework. So my next question to you is, so uh, could you share a bit about your thoughts on AI risk and how does that kind of impact consumers and anybody that uses things like open AI and stuff like that? Yeah, so, um, you know, when I bring up the AI risk topic, it's, it's, um, it's really just disproportionate. It kind of doesn't really fit into an interview where I talk about anything else because it's like, by the way, guys, I think humanity might only have like a decade to live. I think AI might completely destroy the world. But, you know, if you want marketing tips, <laughs> it can give you that too. Um, so it's it's really, like I said, it's it's, it's such a such a big subject. Um, 
but yeah, kind of pivoting from the entrepreneurship tips. Um, if you look at the progress of GPT-4, I do think that it's it's closing the gap between artificial intelligence and human intelligence. I think it's getting closer. In many ways, it's not as intelligent as a human. Um, you know, it can't uh, it can't fight the U.S. military right now, right? It's it's not even close to that, even if you try to ask it to. Um, so it's it's definitely missing some capabilities. But at the same time, it's also you know, passing college courses, right, writing essays better than the majority of the human population is able to do. So on some dimensions, on an increasing amount of dimensions, it's catching up with humans. And I believe that we may be one year, two year, maybe 10 years, if we got really lucky, 20 or 30 years. Uh, but I, I do think that there's this very limited amount of time before you you can no longer name a dimension on which it's not human level or better. I think that's our trajectory right now. And on one hand, this is like very exciting because you can like tell it to do stuff for you and it'll do it cheaply and it'll, you know, produce amazing work. And you can have like a doctor that you can call uh, who gives you like really good medical advice, um, you know, for, for, for like pennies on the dollar, right? So there's a lot of great benefits of having this super intelligent AI. But the problem is just that um, all the infrastructure we've built as a human society is vulnerable to um, a very rapid attack um, from, from this kind of technology. So uh, just as a first scenario, um, if you, if you had something like GPT-4, when it incremented to GPT-5 or GPT-6, and instead of just being able to write a couple functions of code, if it can write, um, more pages of code and it can do hacking, right? It can understand how to build a virus, which it's not that far from being able to do. Suddenly it becomes the nastiest virus that humanity has ever seen because the virus itself can also embed the super intelligence of GPT. So it can have, it can be a GPT virus and not just a virus made by GPT. Um, and when you have that, it's a virus that's very hard to clean out of any particular computer because it's hacking against you. As you're trying to issue commands to a computer to clean out the virus, it is not, it is essentially slapping those commands away or it's issuing commands to protect itself. Okay, um, looks like my video disappeared. All right, give me a sec. I'm gonna work on uh, getting my video back. Here we go. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so, but anyway, that's, that's pretty much the, the shape of the story here, right? Is you've got, and if, and if you have a virus that refuses to be cleaned out, suddenly you've got this, you know, it's, it's replicated on a billion computers and humanity's infrastructure runs on these computers. Hospitals run on these computers. The food supply chain runs on these computers, right? The government runs on these computers. And if the virus is suddenly in all there, because it spread really quickly before we could stop it, what's the next thing to happen? You know? That was an absolutely interesting discussion. And now I wanted to pivot away and go into my last question, which is what do you look for as an angel, angel investor? And seeing as though like you've invested in some companies like Coinbase, et cetera. So what are those metrics per se that you look for when you're investing in a company and how do you kind of source your deal flow? So as an angel investor, you know, I'm, I'm not really a professional angel investor. I'm just a guy who's angel invested a lot, right? And, and a few of them have gone well. The one that's gone the best is ironically Coinbase. Um, I got more than a 1,000x return, which was life-changing for me. Um, I turned uh, $10,000 into what was at the very peak, if I timed the sale perfectly, I guess, could have been $25 million out of $10,000. Um, nobody can time these things perfectly. I, I walked away with about $6 million, which I'm more than happy with because if I timed it even worse, it could easily be like 1 million or less. Um, so that was my best investment. I have other investments that are doing well, but uh, Coinbase has got to be number one. Um, but in terms of like my tips or my process, um, it's uh, I don't think that I have a huge advantage. I think that I have a checklist, right? I think I, I'm above average just because I have a checklist and I know how to pattern match and I, I try to get the quantity up, right? So I've done over 150 deals, uh, usually at around a 10K check size. Um, and and the, the kind of boxes I check are like, hey, the founder, can the founder build, right? Can they execute? Um, is Does the founder seem to just be like intelligent, right? The, that's that's a point in their favor. Um, are, you know, are they are they good at talking? Are they good at selling when they talk, right? Do they sound convincing? Do they have like that energy where, where you want to like follow them or, or, or buy what they're selling? Because that's going to help them in their startup career. Um, another thing is the founder market fit, right? The thing they're building, does it, is it something that they kind of deeply know that like the average person brainstorming ideas is going to think of? So if they're saying like, oh, we're going to help you find activities to do, it's like, oh, great. That's what everybody does, right? But if they're like, oh yeah, this, this component uh, of part of the supply chain specifically for aircraft wings, 
right? Like this, this isn't getting serviced well enough. So we're, we're going to help the maintenance on this component. And I'm like, wow, the average person who's uh, smoking in their college dorm is not going to think of this particular idea, right? And, and if they've thought of it, it's probably because they have some insight about it. Um, so that's, that's a point in their favor. Um, another box is I look at what they've built so far, right? And that's something because I'm myself a software builder, right? So I kind of know I can look at something, just a few mockups or just a few clicks and I can be like, okay, this is roughly the level of engineering that must have gone into this. This is roughly the level of uh, kind of like product and user experience um, expertise that they that they seem to possess. Um, so that's another box I check. Uh, I think there's another one or two boxes that I haven't mentioned yet. You know, I try to think about market size, like the vision of the market. So like, what is, what problem is this solving for humanity, right? And if it's like the aircraft wing thing, it's like, okay, well, there's, they're solving like this random market. Okay, great. But like, what could this expand into? Is this a multi-billion dollar market? Is it like a very, very tiny niche market? If it is a very, oh, I look at growth, right? So traction and growth, what's going on with the early users? Do they have a user yet? A lot of times the answer is no. And then I have to use pure logic right? To try to predict what kind of user they'll have, if they'll ever have a user. So I definitely look at early traction. And if I see that the traction is going fast, as as many investors do, um, I value that a lot. And I'm willing to assume that uh, I'm willing to be optimistic that they're going to grow into a huge market if I see them growing fast at the early stage, right? Because it's kind of like an Uber situation. It's like, would I think the taxi market is huge? Probably not. But if I saw Uber growing really fast in the early days, I would probably um, give them the benefit of the doubt that somehow they're going to keep growing um, because I might be wrong, but if I'm right, the upside is very high. Those are some great points and some great kind of checklist that you shared today. And my next question is, how do you source your deal flow? And like, is it mainly through the content you post or do people do inbound or like, how can people pitch to you? Um, that is a good question because I wouldn't say that I have a systematic source of deal flow right now. So there's no one source, which, you know, which I would love to have actually. And if I were spending more time on annual investing, that's what I would do is I would basically just make my own website, which kind of competes with something like a Y Combinator application, right? So, and, and I might even just say like, Hey, just paste your Y Combinator application here. This is where, to, this is how to pitch me. Um, so right now I just, it, you know, people will just email me or message me on, on Twitter and I am open to that. I'm open to cold emails. I try to at least give a response, even if it's like a very brief response being like, okay, this isn't my space, but thanks anyway. Um, so, so that, you know, anybody can uh, pitch me, where do I actually get deals in practice? So there's a few sources. So I have a friend named Tahir who we invest a lot together with, and he's got a lot of uh, unique deal flow because he's, he networks a lot and he, he looks in places where uh, a lot of people don't go. Um, just he networks in different industries that aren't traditionally full of startups. And uh, he's also deep in India. So so my friend is a good source of deals. Um, it is true that sometimes my Twitter presence and, and the stuff I write does get me some unique deal flow. Um, occasionally, uh, um, you know, I get to see deals because people sought me out because they like the stuff I write about. Um, b besides that, sometimes I do, I, I help with interviews like for Y Combinator. And a lot of times I offer to invest. I'm like, look, you want me to help you get accepted into Y Combinator? That, that's fine. But I also like this company a lot and I'm willing to invest whether Y Combinator does or doesn't. Right. So I, I kind of get a look at some of Y Combinator's deal flow through that kind of process. Those are some great kind of ways that you get deal flow. So yeah, 